Who here works with maps at all? One, two, three. Let me ask you a question. How many news stories have you done in the last, I don't know, ever uh, that were based someplace? All news happens somewhere, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. So if all news happens someplace, if a reader or a viewer is taking uh, the time to find out more information about this particular topic, uh, perhaps they're not from this region, would it make sense to add a map or some sort of other visualization to locate that story for them? Maybe. Right? What if it was an interactive map? What if it was a map that was specific to your particular beat? Um, I have lots of maps that I create. I am really bummed out that my computer is dead now because I have a really great list of all the best coffee shops I've ever been to around the world. Um, I also have a list of all the best burgers that I've ever eaten around the world. And I've actually put these together in a map and I'll try to share those on social media later once I get my computer back up and running. I've used a program called, well it's not a program, it's a, it's a feature uh, called Google My Maps. So at the very base level, you go to Google Maps. Who's used Google Maps today? Yeah, yeah I used it to get here today. Um, at the very base level, just sharing a link to a map and saying, here is the place where we're going to meet for coffee or go get a great burger and so on, right? Or where is RJI? How do I get there to, uh, from the hotel? You know, I'm going to use that. I can share what I see directly with a particular individual, or I can embed this directly within my page uh, in my article very easily, right? Just by going to maps.google.com, you look for the little share icon, bloop, there you go, right? So that's basic level mapping. Every story can benefit from at least that much, right? If I wanted to create something that was a little bit more unique, well, I could switch to satellite view. This is the uh, Googleplex. Googleplex uh, in uh, uh, Mountain View, California. Uh, if I wanted to share to somebody where this was, I could embed this directly within my piece and actually even give them the opportunity to get directions on how to get there. This is what I call service-based journalism, right? So not just here's a screenshot of a map that you might be interested in, but literally here's a map that you can interact with. And by the way, you can find directions from where you're at today to where you're trying to get to right within this interface. The Denver Post recently did a very cool post, which is unfortunately locked up on my computer. Uh, it was all the Christmas lights uh, displays uh, throughout the Denver metro area. Um, very simple. It was just a list of pins that they dropped all over the map. Um, but it gave me the ability to actually get directions to go to each one of those. So instead of having to like, you know, download all of them and figure out the addresses and create a whole thing on my own, I was able to just click in that article. Talk about sticky. I had that article open for like two or three hours one day as we were going from light show to light show uh, to, to go view them. Uh, underwater, if anybody's interested in like, well, you guys don't have a ton of ocean out here, but uh, some nice lakes and some nice rivers, I imagine. Uh, street view is just about everywhere, including under the ocean. I'm going to talk a little bit more about street view later on, about how to actually take advantage of that. But what you see is what you get, right? So if you go to street view, even under the water or at the top of a mountain or inside of a restaurant, uh, you can share that image just by clicking on the little uh, three dots here up at the top left-hand corner and go to where it says share or embed. Or if for some reason you even wanted to print it, you can print it as well. Um, another thing here that often people overlook, the report a problem feature, please, if you see an issue on Google Maps or any of our products, take that extra step and report it, right? It actually goes to a team that addresses those things. If we don't hear about them, then they don't get fixed, right? So take that extra step if you, if you have the time. But let's say, for example, like Vice did, uh, you guys uh, may have heard of a podcast called Serial, remember that? Yeah, um, I actually lived in this neighborhood uh, back in Baltimore, right around here-ish, uh, right around the same time that the story, I had nothing to do with the story, by the way. Um, but I find it really, really compelling. This particular story hit home because of how close it was to where I used to live around the same general period in time. Vice did a really great example of using my maps to create points, little data points, of every place that was mentioned within that particular story to geolocate that story for those listeners, right? Uh, this could very easily be restaurants. It could be coffee shops. It could be where all the potholes in town are, right? It could be, you know, a lot of different information. And these maps take very, very little time to create. Uh, this is another example of a my map. This is in Argentina taking a look at floods. Did you guys get floods out here? Yeah? A couple, maybe, once in a while? What about tornadoes? Sometimes? 
Yeah. So these are, I think, really good examples of how to use my maps to alert people. Again, service-based journalism. It's not a screenshot. We have a lot of wildfires in Colorado. Uh, Colorado is just generally on fire all of the time. Uh, not as much as California, but pretty bad still. I see more times than not, unfortunately, uh, newsrooms will publish a map, which is a screenshot within an article about a fire. Does anybody see a problem with that? What do fires have a tendency of doing? Yeah, they spread, they change over time, right? So by the time that article is out, it's already out of date. And in fact, it's dangerous. I think that's the most dangerous kind of misinformation, right? So in this case, in Argentina, they created this map. This is what's called a polygon, right? And it was literally just clicks on the map. You know, you open up maps, uh, Google My Maps, you click these different points and highlight the area that's being affected. You drop in some pens to show you where various different flood zones are or where traffic has been blocked or maybe where there's a rescue center and so on. Uh, this is very actionable information for a reader or for a viewer. Um, similarly, and this is actually a legit version of the MH17 story, uh, this was uh, CTV News. They created this map in about 10 minutes right as this story was breaking. These are all examples of images that were uh, being reported or sent uh, around the crash site of this particular incident. Um, and they showed the flight pattern from Amsterdam just outside of the Ukraine. So again, locate that particular story on the map. Like, who knows where the Ukraine is in relation to everything else? Well, if you read World Affairs, maybe you do, but most readers probably don't, right? So putting this on a map and showing people where that location is is a really good way of helping to tell that story. Now, how do you get these photos into this map, right? Well, you can do it manually, right? You can click, similarly to what these guys did here, manually create you know, by clicking the little pins on the map, and I'll go through this tomorrow and actually show you how to do this live. Um, no, don't restart. Later tonight. Um, or you can upload a spreadsheet, right? So if you have a basic CSV or an XLS file, has various different columns, right? So here are my locations column. Here is my titles of those locations column. And here's a list of images or URLs that I want to link to. That's, that's it, that's all you need, right? So Let's say, for example, you're doing a local story. This is a good one. I think this one was from uh, the BBC, and this was uh, user-generated reports actually from Facebook. These are URLs of photos that were uploaded to Facebook by readers and viewers that submitted their information to a little survey, or maybe it was a link on the article that said, hey, what's the weather in your region? Show us a photo of these crazy thunderstorms that are happening. They took all of that information, linked it in a spreadsheet, and then generated a map within about 20 or 15 minutes using that information. Right, so user engagement, interacting with your readers and your viewers, noise complaints, potholes, you know, what are the stories that happen locally that people are concerned about? Ask for that input, get them to you know, use whatever means that is best to access them with. Uh, Facebook will probably talk about this a lot more tomorrow, right? Where are your readers and viewers? If they're on Facebook, go talk to them on Facebook, right? Interact with them and pull them back to your site. Find a way to interact and engage with them where they are. Right? You can also link all this information to your own website to draw traffic that way if monetization is a question. Um, my maps can be used for a lot of stuff. I mentioned fires. Uh, you know, if you have a Google account, uh, if you don't have a Google account, let me know. I can help you get set up with that. But if you do have a Google account, uh, all of these my maps are just stored within Google Drive. So if you have multiple people working on a particular story, you can share this map and collaborate uh, with them. Uh, on that. Actually, this presentation is a good example that my computer got bricked right before I did my presentation today, so I just shared this presentation with uh, the young lady who was up here who I have uh, forgotten. What is it? Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Oh, Patricia. Throwing me off. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I shared that with her and she was able to access that so I could pull this up. The same thing would work with a Maya map, right? So we try to make it really easy and flexible. All these maps are embeddable, so you can just drop that right within your article as long as your CMS or your uh, site can accept iframes. And if you can't, let me know and I'll help you with that as well. Uh, by the way, you can also access this on mobile as well. So there's a My Maps app on Android. Uh, so you can actually create or interact with maps on a mobile device as well. So if you're out in the field, uh, I think this is a really great way of like quick screenshot, load it up into the map, drop it in. There's a whole workflow that we're in the process now of creating around mobile journalism. So if you only have a smartphone and you're off in the world doing your work, 
how you interface with these various different tools to create information on the fly. We're trying to make that as easy as possible for you. And we also have a whole list of lessons, uh, again, around visualizing data with your map on our g.co slash news website. You, know, you probably hear a repetitive theme going on here. Uh, these lessons are available as well. Uh, these particular lessons will probably take you about 20 to 30 minutes or so if you go all the way through them. Um, but there's a wealth of additional information as well. Uh, we don't have time to get into fusion tables today, but let's say, for example, you're working with a data set that has tens of thousands of rows of information, right? Uh, my maps is probably not the best tool for that, right? Uh, what's an example of that? Well, this is actually a data set from my colleague, Simon Rogers, who used to work at The Guardian and then worked at Twitter for a while, and now he works for us, which is great, because he's amazing. Um, this is a map uh, pulled from Wikilinks at data. So this was a data dump that was given to The Guardian or shared with The Guardian uh, of injuries or deaths in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. So each one of these dots re represents a person. Now, I wouldn't typically recommend creating a data visualization that would look like this. This is really cluttered. We would typically recommend clustering these. So instead of having this big glob here, it would be like a number with a dot on it that says like 200. But I think with this particular story, the the impact of the story is the human scale of this story, right? The, the human element of the story. So seeing the clusters of where these events are happening, and you could obviously see this one particular road here I would probably want to avoid. Uh, this whole region around Baghdad is obviously a really big hot spot as well. This was a process using a, 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 an option called Fusion Tables, uh, which is another tool. It's like kind of like a heavy duty version of Google My Maps. So if you're working with very, very large data sets, this allows you to process them. This Map probably took about 15 minutes to process once the data was cleaned. I will tell you now, if you're starting to work with data, that will be the largest part of your day, is cleaning that data and making it easily accessible and visual, uh, in, in, a, in a format that you can visualize. The actual visualizing of it is relatively simple, right? So back to the public data explorer story that we were talking about earlier. Like let's say I go on to Google search, site colon dot gov, file type, CSV or XLS, uh, keyword, I don't know, uh, injuries or illnesses perhaps. Uh, I could surface data sets that then I could visualize using my maps or I could visualize using fusion tables relatively easily. Um, again, these are linkable. Uh, I think anytime you're putting out social media, a map or some other type of locator visualize, visualization is a really good way of going uh, in addition to an image. Uh, you can also paste or embed these directly within your website as well. Here's an example of a fusion table map. So this one, again, this is looking at flood, a flood story. This is La Nation, uh, put this one together. Uh, this was uh, a map that was actually taking a look at uh, hospitals reporting people who have been injured or died because of these floods. And they were comparing that against the government's own reports. And what they found was a massive discrepancy between the two. There was a lot more people that had died or were injured in these particular floods than what the government was actually saying. Um, and that's, that's not good, right? So again, holding uh, truth to power, I think this is a really good example of how data can help illustrate or illuminate real stories and what's really going on behind the scenes there. Uh, here's another example. So this is another fusion table taking very large data sets. Uh, this is looking at the average price for Airbnb units and superimposing that over another data set of this, these uh, shape files here, which are these green blobs, uh, looking at average price of Airbnb units. And what you're actually seeing here is how certain regions of San Francisco, the prices are way, way high. And there's another narrative there of, uh, rental rates, just general, like, you know, if I'm just trying to rent an apartment, uh, those rates are up really high as well. And by the way, the income disparity in those regions is getting quite wide as well. So you can layer different types of information over top of one another to get a good idea of what's going on in a particular region. Now, again, uh, skills that are portable and that you can take with you and you can really make an amazing career out of. Uh, in addition to learning how to write a really good story, in addition to being able to, to read a data set of some sort, um, verifying and fact-checking information or understanding social media, I think another piece of this is things like the APIs. Coding, ooh, yes, coding. Who here is good at math? That's a, it's a joke. I usually get a lot of questions and a lot of, a lot of responses from journalists. They're like, I'm not good at computers. I'm not good with computers or computers don't like me is usually the, 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 the response that I get. Computers don't like me either. Uh, code. Code is not a scary word, right? I am not a coder, 
but I am learning about the Maps API. And I've been teaching myself this over the last several months uh, because I see this as a portable skill set that allows me to help tell stories in unique ways using data. Because again, all news happens someplace, I feel like understanding how to best utilize mapping technology is an amazing way of telling stories, right? So if you aren't getting what you need out of my maps, if Fusion Tables isn't quite customizable enough, the Maps API allows you to really granularly customize your mapped and information in the way that you want, to fit into the style sheet of your particular site, uh, to fit the formatting that you want, or to help tell stories in a more elegant way that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Uh, this is an example from the New York Times uh, taking a look at a manhunt uh, in different locations that uh, were different waypoints along this story and mapping that and visualizing that. And by the way, this is interactive, so a user or a viewer can click around on this and say like, oh shoot, that's right near my house. Perhaps I should be more aware of this story, right? Uh, here's another example. This one, <laughs> for me, I used to live in New York for like 14 years before I moved to Colorado. Uh, I paid my dues and left. Um, Every time I moved, just about every year, maybe every year and a half when I lived in uh, New York because it's expensive, uh, and I was always chasing the cheap rent, every time I moved, Marathon was happening. Every time. And more times than not, I was like over here and I was trying to move over here. I was like, you know, it was always this issue, right? I was like, where's the, where's the flipping marathon happening? Uh, this is actually a really cool map because this allows you to drag the pens along and see different locations along the, the map uh, route. This was put out before the actual marathon happened so you could pre-visualize where you might want to stand to see the marathon and clap your, for your friends. Um, or if you're, you know, trying to move out of your really tiny apartment and move into another really tiny apartment, this also helps you figure out, well, perhaps I should book that van for a different day, right? Uh, again, really cool ways of using information. I think this one is one of, is super simple. I'm really excited about this one because I'm a big nerd. Uh, this is actually taking a look at the International Space Station uh, live. It actually tracks it using the MAPS API. So you know, NASA actually puts out information about the geospatial location of that particular uh, space station, and you can track and see over time where that's actually at and see where the current orbit is versus the previous orbit. Uh, here's another one. Again, service-based journalism, FOIA, uh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, FOIA des, es, oh, forget it. These guys, really, really powerful newsroom, not particularly well-funded or very large, but very talented in the work that they do. These are uh, nuisance complaints, loud noises, loud bars, potholes, traffic lights that don't work, and so on. They collected all of this information from their readers and from their viewers, from social media, and they created a form where people could fill out and put, you know, like, okay, here's where that location was, here's what the issue was, and then they mapped it. And you can click on each one of these pens and it'll pull up a little bit of information here. This is just a spreadsheet that you're looking at. That's all this is, right? I can in about 10 minutes show you how to actually do one of these tomorrow if you're interested. So as we're thinking about stories that you're working on, if you can bring in a small data set, just a couple columns of information, we can walk through that. And if not, I have a couple that we can use anyway, assuming my computer works. Uh, here's another one. This is another example. This one is from a, gr a group in Canada. Uh, these are all super fun sites or giant oil spills in Alberta. You could type in your address and get an idea of where you're located in relation to these super fun sites. When I lived in Greenpoint in Brooklyn in New York City, turns out my neighborhood was smack dab in front of, on top of one of the largest Superfund sites on the East Coast, which is just great, right? So I, I learned this after the fact. If this uh, was available to me perhaps before I rented my apartment, I may have made different decisions, right? Uh, here's another one. This is uh, from the New York Times again. Actually, let me skip that one. Oh, yeah, these guys. Uh, this is actually a good one. So New York Times, I, I, I tend to not use New York Times as an example all the time because I feel like it's an unfair advantage. Like they have an enormous amount of budget compared to a lot of different newsrooms and a lot of staff. But just to say that these are the types of projects that you also can work on, you don't need a lot of staff or a lot of budget to do these. You just need like a half hour, right? Uh, in this case, this is an example from their 36 hours uh, article, uh, uh, what would you call it, feature. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. I use this quite a bit. So if you have 36 hours in a city, what do you want to check out, where you want to go, right? So these are all examples of different restaurants and different uh, places that they've put up into Google Maps that keep on pointing, there's no laser pointer. Uh, right here it says save from 36 hours. So if you click on that, it goes right back to their article. So what you've done now is created breadcrumbs. You've created a map that has locations that are interesting, that have reviews, have information. They probably sent the photographer to take a 360 photo. I'll show you one of those that I just took at a coffee shop this morning, which is already up into Google Maps. 
And then they've linked back to the 36 hours article. So if you click on that, it actually brings them back to their main page. So there's this continuity between the mapping information, what's on someone's mobile phone. And by the way, you can save each one of these locations on your phone. So as a user or a reader, I'm like, oh, I like that place, star it. After I'm done reading that article, when I'm in that city, I have my 36 hours, I just follow the stars. Now the only thing you have to do is remember to take those stars off afterwards because otherwise you end up like what I have is like thousands of stars all over the world that I'm never going to visit ever again because I'm not going to be there, but it's good. All right, questions on that? Feeling good? Does everybody agree that all news happens someplace? Do you feel good and empowered about how to help visualize that information? A little bit? All right, Google Earth Pro is a whole other section that I'm not going to have time to get into because we're running a little bit over, but what I wanted to show you are just a couple quick examples of how we deliver information to readers or to, uh, to newsrooms. So you can actually sign up, and I'll show you the link here in a minute, for updates of, of information, data sets, or mapping content that is made available to newsrooms even before it's made publicly available within Google Maps or within Google Earth. Uh, this is an old example. Uh, these are four different examples of various different news organizations using uh, uh, imagery from an Armenian uh, hostage crisis that happened in the middle of the Armenian desert uh, a long, long, long time ago. I'm sorry, Algerian. Apologize. There's no desert in Armenia. Um, this is a Google Drive folder, which we have shared high-resolution still satellite imagery. Uh, if you sign up at g.co slash Google Media Alerts, that URL at the top of the page, just go ahead and sign up right now. We will not spam you, we will not hit you with lots of information that's not useful to you, but as breaking news happens, we will provide mapping visualizations and other types of information to you for free before it ends up in Google Earth or Google Maps. So oftentimes what happens is someone's like, oh, this breaking news story is occurring, we can't get a reporter or a helicopter or whatever to that location because it's either too far away or there's just not time. Google Earth and Google Maps is a really good way of digging into that information because you have street view and then satellite information available, right? But if that information is not updated, that doesn't always do you a lot of good, right? So this is up to the minute uh, accessible information. This is just a look at Google Earth Pro. These are, this is actually looking at the Ukrainian uh, MH17 crash satellite imagery looking at those particular locations as that story was uh, unfolding, right? These are in black and white because these particular satellites uh, only shoot in black and white. But as we updated those maps, we provided additional resources and other, other information. Um, using Google Earth Pro, you can export very high resolution still images and use those as a template or a back plate to overlay additional information over to, uh, over on top of. Uh, so if you're not perhaps familiar with where in the Ukraine this particular story took place, uh, this makes it really easy to geolocate that information. Uh, what else, what else, what else? Oh yeah, so change over time. I think satellite imagery is a fantastic way to show change over time. Do you guys have any issues going on here with environmental, like climate change, or like, you know, rivers moving in different directions, or anything like that, with, because of floods or fires, or else, you know, other types, maybe population density, how various different uh, regions are growing, and like the suburban sprawl is occurring. That's happening really uh, a big issue here in uh, Colorado, uh, where I live. Um, Resource management is a big deal, right? Water is scarce in Colorado. Uh, or let's say My Myanmar here. So this was a flood uh, and inundation uh, that happened uh, in this particular region. This is before and after imagery showing the effect of those particular floods, right? You can potentially imagine that being done here in uh, Missouri as well, showing the flood inundation. Uh, this is way too fast of an uh, animated graphic, uh, but what this is is an example of showing a building being uh, built over time using still satellite imagery. Um, what else? Animations, you've probably seen these. I mentioned these earlier. Uh, so this is an example of one of those Google Earth animations. Uh, it used to cost about $400 to download a version of Google Earth Pro to create these types of animations. Now it's free. Uh, and I'll actually give you a product code and a slide or two, which will allow you to do this. This animation mm, probably took 15 minutes to create and export. Probably took a little bit longer to export than it actually did to create, depending on how fast your computer is. Uh, but for most stories, uh, if you're looking for a really good visual element that catches somebody's eye, uh, animations like this is a really good way of going. And in many cities, there's 3D imagery available, as well as topographical data as well. So you can create these really elegant animations uh, using these tools. Um, as you would expect, there are also lessons on our website at g.co slash newslab, uh, where you can learn to learn uh, more about these particular uh, techniques. Uh, 
there's also an even deeper version of this. So if you're really excited about using Google Earth and want to learn from like back how I remember, uh, remember I may have mentioned, uh, I started off using uh, Google Earth animations with broadcast newsrooms back in 2010. So I've got seven years of experience working with newsrooms around the world. We've created best practices, we've created cheat sheets, we've created the workflows that you need to really get in here and get that animation out as quickly as possible without getting bogged down and like where is the button, how does the thing work. Uh, so this is what I would call like a 201 or a 301 level course on uh, KML, Keyhole Markup Language, which is the programming language that Google Earth works off of. Uh, but really anybody that has a mouse and a computer uh, can use these products and export uh, these really high resolution still or video images out. And I mentioned before, uh, Google Earth is free now, so if you download Google Earth Pro, which is different than Google Earth, Google Earth Pro, it gives you the ability to export those high resolution still images and those export, export those videos as well. Um, you probably don't need this, uh, this key because I think in the, and within the last couple of weeks it's actually made, become like completely free. So if you just log in with your email address and then just hit send, it should allow you then to get access to Google Earth Pro. If you guys get stuck with that, let me know and I can help you walk through that. But it should be relatively easy. The last little bit uh, that I would want, want, want to mention as well is Google Earth Engine. So this is a really interesting tool. This is super fun to play with. Uh, again, don't plan anything for the weekend. You can just play with these tools. Uh, this is a bit of a wormhole as well. Uh, here's an example of, so what Google Earth Engine time lapse is, is looking at information, uh, satellite imagery that's been scrubbed of all the annoying things like clouds or fog or other kinds of uh, issues that would prevent you from being able to see the terrain. That's usually the biggest issue with satellite imagery is like, you know, we have an atmosphere that we have to deal with. Uh, but so this is scrubbed uh, that uh, imagery of all of those annoying bits. This is taking, does anybody know where this is? No? So it's either Los Angeles or it's uh, Las Vegas. Uh, this is a giant lake over here that as you see is shrinking as this area expands and becomes more populous. There is a relationship that is occurring here. Uh, this helps to visualize this from the sky to show you the scale and change and pace over time, right? So again, I was mentioning before and after imagery. I think this is a really good example of that, whether it's in the Brazilian Amazon or a glacier or maybe in Missouri, looking at all the development that's going on or the changes in the highways or whatever the story might be. Anywhere on the planet, you can zoom down and see satellite imagery and see how it changes over time to give people a little bit better of an idea of how their world is changing. So that imagery goes all the way back to 1984 um, and up to about 2012 uh, currently. And all that is embeddable as well. So if you go to g.co slash earth time lapse, uh, it'll pull up a lot of more information about that. Uh, you know, you can embed that in your site to give additional uh, narrative around a particular story. There's a tour editor that you can uh, use to create those animations. It would probably take you about 20 minutes to figure out how to use that. If you, again, have a mouse and a computer, uh, you have the ability to create these types of things. Um, we also send out media alerts on a pretty regular basis. So if you sign up for g.co slash Google media alerts, we will show you examples of how other new Newsrooms are using these tools. We'll give you up to date satellite imagery as these stories break. And if you ever have a question, you're like, oh man, like I need imagery of this particular thing or this particular location, just shoot us an email, newslab support at google.com. We can't always guarantee that we can deliver on that, but if the clouds are being kind, if there is enough turnaround time, and if it's affecting a large enough of a population, uh, we often at times are able to provide that information. So g.co slash Google Media Alerts. If you want a master's level training on Google uh, Geo Tools, bit.ly slash Geo Media Lab is another resource. This is about six to 10 hours worth of content, depending on how fast you read. Uh, but this, coupled with the Mapsy API stuff, coupled with the g.co slash News Lab training, is essentially in my opinion, all the information you would ever need to know uh, about Google tools. Uh, and if you don't get what you want, you can always ask me and shoot me an email. I'll be happy to point you in the right direction also. Google.com slash permissions. I often get the question, can I use this map in my article, in my piece? Can I download it and I include it in my print paper? How do I properly attribute Google? We've created a website for you, google.com slash permissions. It will answer all of those questions for you. If you don't find the answer you're looking for, newslab support at google.com, and I'd be happy to help point you in the right direction.